The third time in my life I was overwhelmed by the miracle of a baby coming into the world. Watching a baby come into the world is a combination of everything that is good and bad, beautiful and disgusting. Few other words can describe it. I moved from my wife's side to the delivery doctor's side so I could better see the baby come into the world. I did the same thing when both of my children were born. Why should this time be any different, even though the baby emerging from my wife's womb is not mine? A miracle is a miracle. Everyone in the delivery room realized that the baby was not mine. I was there solely to support my wife in her time of need, for better or for worse, as the vows say. This is definitely grief. The child in question is the daughter of my wife and her boss, Simon Green. No one on the ward knew that I knew who the father of the child was. Tracy hadn't told me who the father was, but had informed her gynecologist and his staff, so that the baby's birth certificate, which I wasn't supposed to see, would have his name on it. Yeah, it's complicated. As per my wife and I's agreement, I leave my house a month after she and the baby come home. As I said, that month was dedicated to the support I felt I owed her for 17 years of marriage and two wonderful children. The reason I don't owe more is because of the infidelity that led to the birth of the baby. She and her lover had been sleeping together for about a year, as she admitted to me when she told me seven months earlier that she was pregnant, 13 years after the birth of our second child. I had a vasectomy. To say I was furious is an understatement, but she hung in there and didn't tell me who the baby's father was because he has a wife and three kids, and she didn't want me to destroy his family. Damn it, he's allowed to ruin my family and you don't want me to ruin his? You're a sentimental, stupid martyr, I shrieked. It was over between us at that point, but I stayed in the house for the sake of our two children, 15-year-old Millie and 13-year-old Gary. After weeks of yelling and fighting, we came to the point where I would stay here for a month after she had the baby. She said his father wanted nothing to do with the baby, so I agreed to go to childbirth education classes with her, be present in the delivery room, and stay there until she and the baby got settled in. Then I'll leave. I'm a certified public accountant, not the most interesting job. I have no military background, I'm not a spy, I'm not mobbed up, but surprisingly, I have some good connections in business, so I'm not out of options. In two weeks, I learned Simon Green's name, address, phone number, bank account numbers, and personal history all the way back to 8th grade. I hadn't told my wife any of this. I moved to my wife's head as the doctor cut the umbilical cord and handed the baby to the nurse to examine and wash. She is beautiful, almost as beautiful as ours, I said, wryly, brushing the sweat-wet strands of hair out of her eyes. I could tell by the sad look in her eyes that my remark hit the mark. Then her eyes rolled back as the soft hum in the room turned into a cacophony of noise. People began to disperse quickly, and one of the nurses told me I had to leave immediately and pushed me toward the door. I normally walked in the direction she pushed me. A few minutes later, a doctor slowly came out of the delivery room, his robe had a lot of blood on it. He said that something unexpected had happened, a bleed had opened up and he hadn't been able to stop it in time. He was very sorry, but Tracy was gone. I remember collapsing to the floor before darkness came over me. Are you going to contact the father to get the baby? I asked the doctor as he and the nurse brought me to my senses. I don't think we should do that, Dr. Robert Kremkat said. I think I need to talk to the hospital administrator about it. Even though I knew I didn't want to raise Tracy's child, I didn't want the child to go into foster care, especially when there were legal parents around to raise him. I pressured the hospital administration to call Simon Green. I was on the ward when the receptionist called and explained the circumstances of Tracy's death. From what the receptionist said, it didn't sound like Simon wanted to take responsibility. Later, I turned up on the doorstep of Simon Green's house, knowing that his wife, Valerie, was there. In the six years that Simon and Tracy had worked together, we had met several times. She was shocked to hear of Tracy's death and wondered why I was at her house and not with her grieving children. I pulled out my phone and showed her a picture of Tracy and Simon's baby. I didn't need any words. There's the little rat, she shrieked. It took a few minutes before I managed to comb her down enough for her to speak. 
I explained that if she and Simon didn't take the baby, my in-laws, Tracy's parents, would try to adopt it. Even though her parents and I were now feuding over Tracy's behavior, I knew they would do everything they could to raise the child. But first, in my opinion, the surviving parent should be given a chance, and it also gave you a great chance to ruin my husband's life and marriage as badly as he ruined yours, Valerie said sharply. I can't say that thought wasn't considered, I admitted, but at the same time, neither is the fact that a child shouldn't have a single parent. I'm not saying you shouldn't come out of this with nothing, but I think it should be negotiated between you and your husband. Also, you should make sure I don't get arrested and sued when I get physical revenge on him because that's gonna happen someday. I went home to my upset children, my father-in-law and mother-in-law, and my parents were also in the house. You're not going to leave now, are you, dad? Gary asked as we sat at the dinner table. No, but I'm going to cancel my alternate plans now. We're going to stay together as a family, I replied. I felt myself becoming uncomfortable at the table. I knew what the unasked question was, but I wasn't going to answer it until someone had the courage to ask it. My mother-in-law had to do it. What about the baby, Damien? Marilyn asked. Will we be able to raise him? At the moment, it's up to the father, I answered. Legally, it's his child. He will have to give up his rights before you can raise him. Will we ever see our sister, half-sister? Millie asked, changing the question halfway through as she looked at my face. I guess it would be up to the child's father. If he decides to do the right thing and raise the child, your rights as a half-brother and sister are not as much as his rights as a father, I replied. If the father says it's okay, can I take her in sometimes? Millie asked. When I felt all eyes on me, no, I answered bluntly. I don't want to be reminded that your mother cheated on me in this house. If you want to spend time with her and her father allows it, you can see her at her grandparents' house. Without looking at them, I could feel my father-in-law and mother-in-law's embarrassment. At least this time, I didn't call my late wife a whore, although that would have been accurate. The goodbye and funeral were not easy. Most of our family and close friends knew of our estrangement over Tracy's infidelity. Most of them knew that I had a vasectomy years ago, so they realized that her pregnancy was from another man. While I didn't wish her dead, we were in the process of divorcing, so I'm sure many of our relatives thought my grief was somewhat hypocritical. Hell, I'll admit I thought I was pretty hypocritical myself. We did have 16 good years of marriage. I'm not counting the last year, and we'd been together for three years before marriage. That's the kind of Tracy I'm going to miss. I'll admit, the first thing I noticed about Tracy was the tight t-shirt covering what looked like a pair of melons as she and a friend strolled across the Michigan State University campus at the beginning of sophomore year for both of us. She was 5'7 and maybe a 55 pound, and most of that weight came from her t-shirt. Holy shit, look at that, I said to my roommate, Benji, as the two women walked in front of us. Wow, Benji responded. Wow, Benji would never be a best-selling author or songwriter. We turned our heads in the direction the women were headed. I stared at her long blonde hair and firm ass as they walked in front of us. I was blown away, not even knowing if she had character or brains. It was two weeks before I learned that her name was Tracy and that she was a finance major. Finance is slightly less boring than accounting, but you can't learn it without brains. She accepted my dad's offer, and not only did she look like a goddess, but she had an outstanding personality and a kidnap a mile wide, and was a huge sports fan. Bingo! My conservative nature was completely overwhelmed by this force of nature. All I knew was that I needed to make her mine. By the third date, we decided to be exclusive. On the fourth, we had sex. I almost twisted my tongue trying to give her the best sex of her life judging by the way she was shaking. I think I succeeded. A year after graduation, we got married and settled in Denver, Colorado. I got a job at one of the top accounting firms in the state, and Tracy got a job at a large Denver bank. Two years later, Millie came along, and two years after that, Gary was added to the family. We both had good jobs and were making good money. Life was good until it got bad. I never would have thought that would happen. 
She didn't increase the amount of sex or cut me off, never was a bitch to me or the kids, worked late sometimes, but did it her whole career. I worked late sometimes too. She said the kids had gone to her parents' house for the weekend, which wasn't really unusual. She was finishing preparing some sort of holiday dinner, some sort of beef dish, silverware and cloth napkins on the table, our crystal wine glasses. I thought maybe I'd get lucky for the whole weekend. The food was delicious. My expectations were just off the charts when Tracy served chocolate cake with coffee for dessert. All through the meal, I waited for her to make some sort of announcement. Finally, she cleared her throat. When pregnant, Dame, she whispered without taking her eyes off the table. I groaned, I heckle choke. I threw up on the gorgeous lace tablecloth, the end of a perfect evening, the end of my marriage as I knew it. Tracy cried out as my vomit hit the table. I screamed, jumping up and grabbing a roll of paper towels. I jumped up too but immediately ran to the bathroom and shook out the remnants of that delicious meal. When I got back to my room, I had already washed my face and wiped away my tears. Tracy had taken the tablecloth off, stuck it in the washing machine, and completely washed the table. Damn it, Tracy, why didn't you just stab me in the heart with a big knife and make it quick? I wheezed. You can't be serious. I'm sorry I spilled it out on you, dame. Just thought we could have a nice dinner and discuss things like adults, Tracy said. I collapsed on the living room couch, my stomach fighting with my head over which part of my body felt worse. It probably would have felt even worse if my wife hadn't just ripped that organ out of my body. I had so many questions. Who, Tracy? I finally asked. You don't need to know that yet, she said calmly and quietly. He has a family, and you shouldn't ruin their lives. Why is it that your lover can ruin our marriage and our family? but you're protecting his family. You clearly love him more than you love us, I said accusingly. I don't love him more, but I care about him a lot, she replied. We've been having an affair for about a year now. I didn't expect that, dame. For a long time, we were just friends, but eventually, we made a connection. No, no, we should have a connection, just you and me, not you, and me and you and your lover, I said. But it was never about you and me, it was outside of a Damien, she said. You would never have known if I hadn't gotten pregnant, and that brings up another problem. Not only were you having an affair, you slept with him without protection. Couldn't you have seen it coming, or did you just not care? Tracy blushed thickly but didn't answer anything. Why, Tracy? Wasn't I enough for you? Am I not enough for you anymore? Oh, God, I said. Maybe this isn't about you, dame, she whispered. Maybe it's just what I needed. I was a good wife and mother. I'm still a good wife and mother. I already told you that it wasn't about you or our children. I never denied you anything. I never took time away from our children. A good wife doesn't go beyond marriage. You said you needed it, but I think you just wanted it. Big difference, although nationally, it still doesn't matter. You cheated. End of story, I said. She sat down on the other end of the couch from me. The silence was incredibly loud, so I assumed you told me about the affair because you intend to keep the baby, I said grimly. Otherwise, you would have quietly fixed the problem and just said you had some kind of fungal infection, so you could avoid sex with me for a while. Hence, assumption number two, that you plan to divorce me because you know me well enough to know that there's no way I'd raise another man's child. Tracy cast a brief glance at me but quickly looked away before she could catch my gaze. Actually, that's an incorrect assumption, dame. My partner wants nothing to do with this baby, but I'm not going to give up on him. I want us, me, and you, to raise him as our own, she said. My jaw dropped. I felt weak. What the hell? I muttered. Please tell me I've fallen into some strange dimension. My wife can't ask me to raise a child with another man, confident that many of our friends know he can't be mine. Why don't you just ask me to let you cut my balls off with rusty scissors in front of a huge audience? I know it's big, huge, okay, astronomical request. I know it seems crazy, but this is my baby. 
You can do this for me. I will spend the rest of my life making it up to you, she pleaded. Don't give it up for your ego. You're a strong man, dame. You can do this for me, for us, please. No one with any self-respect is that strong, I growled. Forget about the baby for a second. You've been cheating on me for a year. That's unacceptable shit, my remark made Tracy recoil. I never treated her so rudely before. The next day, I called on the phone and asked for a few favors. At least Tracy didn't try to ambush me. A week later, when she asked to speak to me, she honestly admitted that her partner wouldn't be able to support her during her pregnancy and tearfully asked me to stay in the house with her and the kids, at least until the baby was born and things settled down. When I agreed, she surprised me with another request. I know I don't have the right to ask for anything else, but could you come to labor and delivery classes with me again and come to the delivery room again, she asked timidly. I know you enjoyed the first two times you were in labor. It shouldn't be too hard for you. You're right, you know. I'd volunteer to go into the delivery room with any woman who asked me to. Why not you? It's a deal, but I'll be gone a month after the baby is born, I announced. Tracy and I sat the kids down and told them what was going on when Tracy was just starting to show signs of pregnancy. None of the kids took the news well. Great, not only is my mother a slut, but she's a knocked up slut. The first person who says anything to me will lose a few teeth, I'll tell you what, screamed Millie. Well, maybe my friends will stop drooling over you when you get big and fat, Gary said. Not necessarily, Gary. Her breasts will be the size of basketballs. Your horny friends will always come over to our house and stare at them, Millie said sharply. As the children made their remarks, Tracy cried. Normally, at this point, I would have stepped in and said a few harsh words, but I was having none of it, especially after I announced my intention to leave a month after the baby was born. Your mother made a mistake, but that doesn't mean she still doesn't love you, and that mistake doesn't mean you can disrespect her, especially around me. We all go through it one way or another. Things will change, yes, but you will need your support and love more than ever, I said. And this is coming from someone who is going to leave after the baby is born, Millie snorted. I can't say you're wrong, but my situation as a husband who's been betrayed is a little different than yours as her children. A baby just makes everything more obvious and awkward. I would have divorced your mother even if she wasn't pregnant, I explained. Tracy sobbed harder and was about to leave, but I grabbed her arm and pulled her back to sit with us at the kitchen table again. You have no right to run and hide and act like a fountain. This situation was created by you and your lover, and you're gonna sit here and take whatever rocks the kids want to throw at you. Face it, I growled. The kids asked us both a few questions. Tracy refused to give me the name of her lover when Gary asked who she was cheating with. He surprised me when he changed the subject and asked if she would at least tell him it was someone the family knew, so he could avoid him in the future. It was obvious that the question surprised Tracy as well, as she silently studied her son before answering in the negative. Did you at least tell daddy who the asshole was, so daddy could beat the spirit out of him, he immediately blurted out. In response, Tracy's face turned crimson. First, there was anger in her eyes, and then guilt. That's the reason I didn't tell your father, she said. I'm afraid he'll do something stupid and end up in jail. It's not like you've ever done anything stupid, Millie said, wryly. Tracy shuddered and growled with anger. This is the first time in my life I've ever seen my daughter challenge her mother on what I would call a purely feminine level. Don't even think about it, bitch. I'm not sure your pregnant ass is going to want any of it from me, Millie shouted, jumping up and heading up the stairs to her room. I glared at my wife, got up from the table, and headed upstairs to try and calm my daughter down. It took a few days, but Millie apologized to Tracy for her disrespect, and it seemed to me that as time went on, they became a little closer again. Over the next few weeks, I saw their quiet conversations a few times as I realized word was slowly spreading in the community that Tracy's pregnancy was not from me. I am neither blind nor deaf and could see and hear several co-workers and acquaintances discussing my life as I entered the room. I usually received pitying looks from the women and lecherous smirks from the men. 
Of course, nothing was ever said too loudly in my presence. With my wife, however, things were somewhat different. She told me that as the weeks went by and her belly and breasts grew, some of her female co-workers and friends became more brazen in their snide comments and jokes. Today, Mary from the credit department remarked rather loudly as I walked by that my breasts could probably feed a small third world country, Tracy said when I got home. Everyone around me giggled, then Janet remarked that it probably takes a small third world country to manufacture my maternity bras. No one tried to hide their laughter as I left. I was so embarrassed, she cried, and I went over and put my arm around her. It was one of the few times I had touched her since she had told me about her betrayal. She looked into my eyes, and I saw anger in them. I know this all happened because of my own stupidity, she whispered in apology. I was selfish in so many ways, didn't pay attention to the rest of the family. Things got worse when Millie came home a week later and said her friend had heard three boys at school discussing how to find a date for the spring ball. They were deciding who would invite Millie because if her mom is such a big slut, then of course Millie is just as big as a slut. Gosh, mom, thanks to you, I'm now a high school slut, even though I'm still a virgin. I hope you're happy. Perhaps the scariest moment came two weeks later, as Tracy told me she enjoys her best friend in the neighborhood. We're having tea and donuts at our house on a Saturday afternoon when Joyce confided to Tracy that several of the women in the neighborhood had struck up a conversation about Tracy. Allegedly, one of them had heard that she had sex with four different men, and another had heard that she had sex with three. When I tried to defend you and said there was only one, the others called me either naive or a liar, Joyce told Tracy. God, I'm such an idiot, Tracy cried, turning to her friend. We've been getting along well for weeks now. After Tracy's confession, I slept in the guest room. I didn't know if she was still sleeping with Simon, but I had no desire to be in the same bed with her. She talked me into going back to our bedroom a few times, but I had done my best to make sure she was convinced that wasn't going to happen until I still had some things in the master bedroom. One evening, just before bedtime, I looked in there to grab something just as Tracy was coming out of our bathroom, drying off after her shower. She was six months pregnant, and I estimated that she had gained about nine pounds, all of which was due to her pregnant belly and huge breasts. I stopped and gave her a lustful look. I'll admit, I've always been a little attracted to pregnant women, and I really enjoy Tracy's first two pregnancies. See anything you like, stranger, she heard. I'm sure I drooled before I walked over to her and took her breasts in my hands like one does with big melons. It had been a long time since we last had sex, and I'm sure I just lost my mind at that moment. I immediately pressed my lips to hers, and when she responded to my enthusiasm, we started. After that, we pressed against each other. I felt drained and satisfied physically, but emotionally, I was restless. I had no idea what Tracy was thinking but I knew that everything we were doing was purely physical. I had no emotional connection with Tracy while we were having was, as they say, just sex. I needed her to understand that. That was amazing, dame, as good as it's ever been, Tracy exclaimed, resting her head on my chest. We shouldn't get divorced. We just need time to work it out. I'm sorry, Tracy, but I can't deal with what you've done to me, I said. It was wonderful, but it was just physical attraction on my part. There was no connection. You make me so horny with your big pregnant belly and huge bus, she saw loudly. I knew I had just crushed her, but I didn't want her to get her hopes up for no reason. Even though she wasn't being honest with me, I somehow felt the need to be honest with her, at least about this. Thanks for being honest, babe, I guess, she whispered. Do to have anything to tell us? Millie asked the next morning when Tracy and I staggered into the kitchen. Tracy blushed, realizing what Millie was talking about. Smiles shone on both Millie and Gary's faces. Tracy couldn't look at either of the children. I'm sorry, kids. We must have gotten carried away last night, Tracy whispered. No, we have nothing to say to you. The smile literally slid off both children's faces. They were suddenly busy with their cereal. After the kids left the house to do what kids do these days, Tracy and I talked some more about what had happened. I don't mean to quarrel, Tracy, but you look very needy last night. 
Don't you get anything else from your lover? I asked. That's it. We've grown a little cold to each other in recent weeks, she replied. I'm not sure he likes my pregnancy that much, at least not as much as you did last night, she smiled lightly at me, and it reminded me of how things had been until a few months ago. I smiled back, realizing how much Tracy's pregnant body had always affected me. She took my hand in hers. You know, we could at least help each other out, she said. You do remember how turned on I get when I'm pregnant, don't you? And of course, I know you like my pregnant body. There's no commitment, just two old friends who crave each other. And who knows, she raised her eyebrows lustfully, looking at me. Damn it, why did she have to ruin our lives? Now that the kids are gone, why don't we go back upstairs, she asked. It was my turn to raise my eyebrows. For the next two months, until the doctor told her not to have sex, Tracy and I tried our best to skin me. We slept together every day, morning and evening, for two plus months, and despite her condition, it wasn't soft and gentle sex. It was real sex, where there were no limits, and we both enjoyed it to the fullest. We made a little noise from time to time, which embarrassed Tracy more than anyone else in the family. My 13-year-old son practically records my ecstasies from across the hall, she complained one day after we had finished having hard sex. No boy should learn about sex by listening to his pregnant mother having sex. Maybe, but as a former 13-year-old boy, I can tell you there are worse ways to learn about sex, I said with a wide grin on my face. She slapped my arm and buried her face in my chest. We drifted into a short nap. A few weeks later, Tracy called me at work and informed me that her water had broken. I informed my boss and went home to pick Tracy up and take her to the hospital. I called my father-in-law and mother-in-law so they could come to my house and take care of the kids. So they could come to my house and take care of the kids. The last few months have been so good, Dame, Tracy said as I drove the car. I really screwed up. I've gotten complacent, a smug wife, self-righteous mother. I got too close to another man when I should have been talking to my husband. None of this is about you, Dame. I'm sorry I hurt you, and yes, I'm sorry I did it. Can you ever forgive me? I'm working on it, baby. Maybe someday in the future, after the divorce, we can still be friends. That would be great because we have two kids together, and I'm not going to give up on your parents, I said, smiling. They're very good parents, aren't they, she joked, good-naturedly. I really, really want to thank you for that, for the classes, for the birth, for everything. You could have sent me packing, but here we are instead. Thank you, baby. Valerie Green turned out to be a wonderful woman. I know I couldn't have done it, but you ended up adopting her husband's baby with Tracy. I would have loved to be there for that discussion. A few weeks after we met on the day Tracy died, she called me and told me that she had decided to adopt the baby so that she and Simon could raise him as their own. She explained that she and her husband had had a stern heart-to-heart -heart talk and it was her decision, not theirs, to raise the child. The child shouldn't have to suffer because my husband couldn't keep himself in his pants and your wife died, but when he recovers, he'll be the best father to any child, Valerie said. There was a long silence while I considered what Simon Green's wife had just said. She caught my confusion. If you remember, you told me that you were going to get revenge on my dim-witted spouse and that I should just let you do it. Well, how about your revenge sort of blends in with mine? We met in the darkened back parking lot of a rather expensive restaurant in town. A few weeks later, Valerie told Simon that they had dinner reservations. He was surprised when I stepped out between two parked cars shortly after he got out of his car. We had met several times over the years, so he knew who I was. There was a look of shock on his face as I walked right up to him and swung my right hand at about the level of his chest. The second and crack of Simon's jaw easily overrode the pain in my arm. I saw him bounce off the door of his BMW and then fall to the ground. He lay there moaning, and Valerie slowly walked around the car and over to me. I handed her the wad of nickels I held in my right hand, and she put them in her purse. I nodded at her and backed further into the shadows but didn't leave. Though I don't think the two of you are close to equilibrium, 
Damien assured me that this is the only time he'll ever retaliate against you for ruining his marriage and his life, not to mention impregnating his late wife, unless I tell him that you'll go back to your girl hunting ways in the future. You won't retaliate, and you won't press charges against Damien because then I'll have to tell the police I didn't see anything. Now give me your keys, and I'll take you to the emergency room to have the bruise from your fall on the sidewalk looked at. Any questions, darling? Simon groaned but got up off the ground and handed his keys to Valerie. Epilogue, Valerie has never once called me to reconsider her husband, and I believe he hasn't cheated on her since our mutual agreement in the parking lot. Fifteen years ago, my children say their half-sister is a wonderful child, well-behaved, intelligent, and beautiful. My father-in-law and mother-in-law also speak very highly of her. I am glad that over the years, Valerie has allowed them to socialize with her. Ariel, that's what they named the baby, knows that she is not Valerie's biological daughter. She also knows about Tracy and that I am Millie and Gary's father. On those rare occasions when we end up at the same event, she calls me Uncle Dame. I don't blame Ariel for anything that happened, but she is a living reminder of my personal loss. For several years, I have been in counseling. I'm not sure it's actually helped. For the past 15 years, I've hardly gone on any dates. I now doubt I'll ever get married again.